All right, who's ready for an action-packed two-hour live stream with yours truly, Corey of Aquarium Co-op? All right, let me get set up. It's going to get crazy. It's already warm in here. Sun's beating down on me, even though it's almost Halloween. All the lights are wrong. Hopefully, sound is fixed. I figured out what was wrong. It was using the wrong microphone. So that was a problem for the last two weeks when we lost sound altogether. Now my dog's barking. I can't catch a break today. All right. So spent all weekend hanging out with Fish Tank Mike, Aqua Pros, as maybe some of you know him from the past. Known this man for 10 years almost. It's somewhere close to there. And uh, spent the weekend up here again. This time he didn't knock any trees down and almost kill us all. That's what happened last time I was here. We had no power. But now he's coming back, and we're going to redo the fish room and have a bunch of fun. So that's what we spent the majority of the weekend talking about and kind of just reacquainting myself with the uh, with the, the fish room and what we want to do and the content I want to make going forward and all of that. So, yeah, it was a good time. All right. Sounds good. All right. That's, that's good to hear. Uh, what do I want to talk about today? Uh, someone was keeping 12 discus, an ellipse for eel, some Romino's tetras, no, it's cardinal tetras, uh, roseline sharks, and wanted to add, uh, a Congo spotted puffer. And they're asking for some advice. My advice would be to slow it down. You got a lot going on in that tank. I forgot how big the tank was. Well, let's assume it's big enough. You're running into like... You've got fish that want hard water. You've got fish that want soft water. You've got fish that want uh, meaty food, some that not so meaty. You've got fish that want hot water. You've also got fish that want cooler water. And then you want to throw in a puffer on top of that. It seems like, uh, to me, it seems like the person, and this, you know, people are going to feel like I'm calling them out, but it feels like the people that just have too many pets and that would be, you know, maybe you've got, uh, you know, birds, cats, dogs, fish, a guinea pig. You adopt a, uh, a bearded dragon and you're taking care of them all, but they're not all getting the level of care of like one person, one pet type of deal where it's disproportionate researching the food, researching the care and really putting your all into it. When you mix all those fish into one tank, that's kind of where you get that that menagerie going of like, well, you're, they're all going to do mediocre at best. You know, you're going to have fish that are quicker to the food, some that are slower to the food, some that really want the water changes, some that prefer stability. Uh, and so with all of that going on, I think you're going to, uh, you're just going to run into problems long term. And there's, you got some really cool animals. Discs are really cool. An ellipse for eel, I keep one. Very cool animal. Uh, and I think that's what you kind of focus on. And if you really want all these other animals, great, get more aquariums. The more you try to do with one, you know, imagine, you know, an aquarium is like a car, right? And when you buy the car, you're driving yourself to work, you're driving yourself home. Now you've got a coworker that needs a ride. So now you, you leave home, you pick up the coworker, then you go to work. It's like, oh, it's kind of a, it's a detour, it's kind of a pain. Then you do that same on the way home. Well, now your kid is doing something after school, so can't take the bus. So now, all right, I, on the way home, I gotta, we got to go actually pick up my kid. Then we can go drop off the coworker. Then we can go home. And as you keep adding, you know, now you add on a, a puffer to that mix, it starts getting out of control where the commute's taking a really long time. It's not as efficient anymore. What started out is like, oh, yeah, no problem. You're five minutes away. I can pick you up on the way there. The more things you add, the less efficient the even the original one is getting. And I think that's what happens in the aquarium. The more stuff you add to it, the less the ecosystem is going to handle it all, the less happy all of them are going to be. And you yourself will be that person going, why does it take an hour and a half to get home and to work every day when it used to take me 14 minutes? And it's like, well, you chipped away at it. You chipped away at the satisfaction with each one of those. So I would say focus X amount of animals per 
aquarium. That's usually what you see in my aquariums. You see either one species or a couple of species, and uh, that's it. Yeah, my Tinky was losing her mind at the postman who's delivering something. I don't know. She's over it now, though, so we're good. Why do you guys decide to change the channel logo? Murphy lost the spotlight. Yes, because we're, as you notice, the logo changed, but so did the banner, and it changed everywhere on social media because we're all in on Easy Green. In fact, I got it right here. I just made another video for, like, RPP stores about it. Easy Green. And the craziest part about Easy Green for me is that I still meet 10 people every week online. They're like, i never heard of it. You're like, what do you mean you've never heard of it? Like, I feel like I have talked about this thing to death, but <clears throat> if I've done 11 videos about Easy Green, it's like, that's over 11 years. And so you had to be tuning in at that right time. And so I made an initiative in the company that it's basically Easy Green first. And we're still working on that initiative. And that is to just make sure that everyone at least knows we sell it. Everyone knows some of the benefits about it. Everyone, you know, there's easy to find the literature. We don't go way too long without promoting it, all that kind of stuff, because it is a great product. We love it, and uh, it's our most reviewed product. And so we want to make sure that it stays that way and not falls off, because it's really easy for me to be in love with the new items we're launching, because I've worked on them so hard for the last year, and now it's finally coming to fruition, when really... Something like Easy Green is still one of the best feats we've ever done. When everyone said you can't do an all-in-one fertilizer, we triumphed, or I triumphed, and we did. And there's been, you know, everyone and their mom has got an all-in-one fertilizer now because the manufacturers go, yeah, we'll make you one, we'll put your name on it, what do we care? As long as we sell it. And so that being said, I probably should do a video someday that compares a lot of these all-in-one fertilizers because people just think they're all the same. Half of them are using ammonia as their, as their source. So every time you actually dose it, you're irritating your, your fish. Ours does not use ammonia. Uh, a lot of them, they treat half as many gallons for the same amount of money or more, right? And then you've got things like a, like a Seachem Flourish, which kind of fakes you into being an all-in-one. But the dosages are so low that it's kind of like an all-in-nothing. Like it doesn't do anything really. And... Uh, when we used to get gallons of it for free because we were a platinum Seachem dealer and I think we got like six gallons for free every quarter. We'd have to dose it at, it was either 17 or 19 times the recommended strength to get our plants to respond. And so it was because of that when I remembered, I used to make my own fertilizer. I didn't have this problem. I didn't have to pour half of a bottle and we were <clears throat> we we had all the the planet tanks at the store right and so we were using shot glasses like okay this one gets seven shot glasses full of flourish and then it'd be like okay how much more nitrogen do we got to put in like and so it was getting just out of control and that's where i was like why don't we just make something way more potent again and that's what we did and so now i think the landscape's kind of wide open and everyone's kind of got their own fertilizer and with, without knowing what why it came about, what goes into it, and what are the differences, people are just choosing based on packaging. It happens all the time. And so I should probably do something where, you know, back in the day, it used to be compared like Seachem, API Leaf Zone, and us. And then maybe Thrive, right? And now you've got Tropicas, Dennerlays, uh, H2O Plants, uh, Growth Juice from Dustin's Fish Tanks. You've got there's at least another 10 just on on uh, Amazon. They're just random all-in-ones. And so, but when, you, when, you, when you've designed a product, you can look into it a little bit and you can go, oh, that's the step they skipped. They skipped this, they did that. Okay, I can see where they're cutting corners a little bit because over the years, we've had to, uh, you know, do things. Like there's, there's still brands where I'm like, I don't know how they get away with not telling you what's in it. Like that, that's not legal. Uh so, yeah, it, and it's it's just an ongoing evolution that we are a part of, and uh, we make choices. And, <clears throat> you know, if you've been following us for long enough, it started out as a 16-ounce bottle, treated 2,500 gallons. Then we got more eco-friendly. We didn't want to destroy the environment because it was like, wow, we're selling a lot of Easy Green. So then it went down to a bottle half as much, 
right? The bottle was too in. We started buying bottles from China and things like that, which I know there's people that have issue, but by buying China bottles through China, we saved enough on the bottles to upsize them. And then now you get twice as much for five bucks more. So if we rewind a bunch, Easy Green was 15 bucks treated 1,500 gallons, right? In a big bottle. Then it was 15 bucks treated uh, 2,500 gallons in half as big a bottle. Now it's 20 bucks treats 5,000 gallons in the big bottle. And it's been that way for a couple of years now. And so over time, the evolution of it just kind of keeps getting better where the average company or average competitor, once it's selling, they just move on and ah, it is what it is. So can I specifically look at the UNS ingredients versus Easy Green? It's half the volume, double the price, but it has some slight things added. Would you ever add some to the Easy Green? So I can tell you they're made at the exact same factory. And uh, most people, and I don't know this about UNS, but they take a hands-off approach of like, do you have one? Great, put our label on it. And uh, I'll say, I'll, here's what I'll say. If I wanted to add more things, we would have already done that. We don't want to add more things. We can build a laundry list of things that it puts in, but uh, that doesn't necessarily help you. We, what you'll see is a lot of times we will make a change to Easy Green and then you'll watch those changes roll out to other brands because they're being made at the same factories. Or a factory go, oh, we can just do that too. You found, oh, you're using this. And that can be from the type of salt you're putting in to originally give you that thing. And then there's other choices to be made too where, you know, oh, do we want the nitrogen coming from this or this? One's cheaper. And so, and some people might want to be the budget brand or whatever, you know, everyone's got to make their own choices, but we've tested lots. The manufacturer comes back to us and say, Hey, you want to do this thing? And then we test it and we go, that thing's not better. And sometimes it is sometimes, Hey, that thing is better. And then we would do that, but we like consistency when a product is working well and we've got it tweaked, we've got it dialed in. And I'm not saying easy green won't ever change because there's things that happen like regulations can change. Uh, Availability of products can change. Like, I, I can tell you this. Our pump heads got super crappy during COVID. We had to buy a universal buttload of them because all of it was getting made for hand sanitizer. And so it was a grab and growl situation. Like, if you want pump heads, you better buy them now. And so we bought an absurd amount. And then turns out they kind of suck. I still, to this day... I promise you, I still have never broke a single pump head we've ever had. But apparently it's a problem and I recognize that because you guys have had that problem. I have tried to break these things and I can't get them to break, but that's besides the point. We are now back to the original good pump head that was super tanky, could take a beating. So if you order Easy Green today, you get that pump head. That is officially of today. Uh... You know, we've been shipping it for a little while, but now it's official. I think we may have even updated the website at this point where it says, hey, it says new power, new pump head. But the reality is it's the older one that's super good. But that doesn't that doesn't sound as good. Like, oh, old pump is back. Like, OK, new pump. Everyone will assume a new one is better. And this air, this pump is better. So uh, how in the world do YouTube memberships help you guys? If someone buys a membership and then buys a linear air piston pump, you've already lost a bunch of money. Do you just do it to build the community? Yes. Uh, by and large, the membership product loses us a ton of money every single month. But I like the idea of having a international online fish club that we're always kind of thinking about. How can we make that a little bit better? Uh, I like building a smaller community where you guys can find like-minded people. And on average, like 97 out of 100 of you are good people that don't put each other down. Then there's those three out of 100 that we have to silence and ban. Uh, but also, I like to think that at some point, this big breakthrough will happen with the community where... Uh, a new feature comes out for YouTube or we build a new integration or something happens. And I also like having something that other people don't. Uh, I think that is special and I love to learn. And so 
<clears throat> like I think when I was talking with uh, Mike at Aquapros, his membership is like three, right? Where we're over, what are we at today? Let's let's take a look because we gave away a bunch of memberships last Saturday. So I spent five hundred dollars giving away memberships on Saturday, um, and that was because Dean decided to give away his talk for while it was live. So if you were there while it was live, you could watch it. And then it went to the members. So you got a little glimpse of like what that talk is like. We also, we pay each speaker 500 bucks, which is not game breaking, but in the, uh, in the speaker world, it is the most I've ever been paid. Now this is, I'll, I'll delve into that a little bit, but the most I think I've ever been paid is $200. Now, Normally, if it's a club, I just say, hey, don't even pay me. doesn't matter. I'm here happy to help the community. But when it comes to a uh, like a, an Aquashella where I'm speaking, I'll make them pay for my flight and the hotel and that kind of stuff. But you still don't like make cash, right? So even if, even if I offered you like, I will pay for you to fly over here and mow my yard, but I'm not going to pay to mow the yard. At best, you're still like, yeah, I didn't really come out ahead though. Uh, so you have to, you have to want to mow the yard and, and all of that. So that's how I get reimbursed. And then sometimes there's deals, um, where I'll work with a company. It's like, okay, but I want support for this creator. I've done that a bunch too. Like if you support this creator, I will do this thing for you. Uh, cause I'm lucky in that you guys and gals support me. There are a lot of creators out there that do not get supported. And I'm not saying you don't watch them and you don't do stuff, but there's, there's a big difference between like you have to go to work every day and then make YouTube videos and another one where it's like you wake up and you go, how do I make my fans happy and they will support me? And most people will never reach that. And so the people that are like almost there, uh, I like to help. And so like one example, we did that with a deal with uh, one of one of Zenzo's companies he worked with. And he was kind of stuck in that rut. This is before he worked for us. And I go, you know, I really think Zenzo is good at what he does. I think he represents a part of the hobby that was not served as well back then. That was kind of the African cichlid part. And that helped him keep his channel going. And it's still going to this day where it, without that, you look at it and you go, well, you know, he's got, he's got daughters going into college. He's got a wife. He's got a career. He's got all these things going on. He's got aging parents. It just wouldn't have happened anymore. And I thought that'd be a loss for the community. And so did another company. And so by linking those kind of things up and you build that trust and that will and all of that through uh, doing these things like aquashellas and aquatic experiences and doing the extra vendor only talks and doing the VIP parts and doing these things. Um, that's how you build that goodwill. And then you try to use that goodwill for something else. And then eventually, what do you know? Zenzo works for us. And so I do believe that while membership itself is a money losing scenario. And and YouTube in general is money losing. We spend far more money on YouTube than we get back in ad revenue or memberships. However, you guys also buy from us and be the combination of those makes it so we are not losing money, which is obviously very good. So uh, yeah, it's not a cherry case or anything like that. But the more money we bring in, the more we can kind of redistribute and you won't always get the advantages. Sometimes, you know, like, oh, well, we're going to donate all these things to the Keystone Clash. You might not attend the Keystone Clash. You get nothing for it. Uh, but we try to give you coins. We try to give you, a, you know, a Yeti mug at, or a Yeti container at the five-year mark. We used to do some dinners, and, and we still want to do some stuff at the retail store, and, and there's still ideas. So, um, you know, I, I still feel guilty every day. Like, how do we do more international? But it's, it's something I haven't been able to solve yet. So yeah, originally I was trying to see how many members we had in total. In total, we got to go to the earn button. We have, wait, it's loading, 3,769 members. So uh, good news is less people have canceled this month. Yeah. Woo. Only 286 people have canceled their subscription this month. <laughs> yeah. Which those numbers, when you read them, they, they bum me out. And you can read, you know, so the responses are 58% said financial reasons, 25% said other, 8% said no longer interested, and 8% said it wanted to join for a limited time. 
So it's a bummer to see, like, oh, man, like, 58% of people don't have the extra five bucks. Like, that's not good. Like, that's a bummer. So, all right. We, we got that stat, though. We got, the, we got the story done. That's what matters. What are my thoughts on the Heiger 987 light? I have no idea. I don't know what light that is. I will say Heiger flew into Seattle. They came to my store and were trying to talk to me, but I wasn't there. So who knows what they want? Can we get Irene and Zenzo member emojis? Yeah, maybe at some point we'll make some more uh, emojis and that kind of stuff. It's just uh, low on, not low on the priority list. The list of stuff that we want to do is vast, and the amount of hours in the day is not. So I say that's kind of where that falls in, I think. Root tabs in a paludarium. I think this is a beneficial idea. And it has a constant water flow over the substrate, then a mix of aquatic and tropical plants. Uh, I think it could work just fine. I, in that scenario, though, you know, I, I want you to buy a million root tabs. But the reality is, probably in the paludariums, it makes more sense to just use some dirt because the plants you're buying already come in dirt. So I feel like that's you know like half what I'd be doing. What am I seeing like, what is, let's see, right there. My camera's weird. I'm trying to figure out what it's pointing to. Oh, it's this, it's this rogue bottle of Easy Green. I was like, what is over there? There we go. Now my, now my screen's clear. How's my silent business partner? Doing good. Talked to him today a little bit just through text message. Uh, he's going a little bit stir crazy. He's stuck at home. He's on uh, some seizure meds which means he can't drive. He hasn't had a seizure, but that's just, I guess it's normal precaution if you have uh, two brain surgeries and a stroke. They're like, let's make sure you don't have a, a seizure, but on those meds, you're not supposed to drive. And so he's got people to drive him around and do some stuff, but at the same time, a lot of recuperation, uh, still on, I think, antibiotics and other other stuff like that. So, you know, trying to, trying to keep his spirits up and just check in on him and, and all of that. I know we've got a, He's going to be part of a, a business meeting tomorrow night. So there's still, you know, still stuff like that. Mm. A question about the L397 Pleco. In my experience, or what have I heard regarding temp and water hardness? What is more, wait, more ideal? Uh, the 397 is, isn't the candy stripe Pleco? Let me, let me look. Uh, yeah, it is. And so Dean breeds them and his water is not very hard. He's got a little bit of crushed coral to help with that a little bit. He does run his fish room a little bit warm, more like 81, 82. But, uh, yeah, I would say that's kind of ideal. He's got him cranking out. Any chance on getting member coins through April's Aquarium here in Canada? Is there any chance? Yes. But we need to, uh, you know, we need to find a way to benchmark it. So let's say we, we put all the coins up there. You walk in. You're like, hey, here's my membership. It says three years. You get three coins. How do they know that you don't also get three coins four months later? And how do we know that when we start shipping to Canada in the future, we don't ship you three coins, right? So we need to develop, and we, and we have this own fault in our own retail store. We don't have a good way to track a physical point of sale interaction and track the coins without doubling up and having these problems. So it's on the list of wonder if we can figure it out, but hasn't risen to the top thing yet. What's my, my daughter wants to ask what my favorite Taco Bell order is. I told her it's a Mexican pizza. You know, honestly, that, that was my favorite for a while, for sure, and a luxury. But it's been rough to even eat there because, in my opinion, the quality has gotten poor and the cost has gotten insane. The last time I ate there, I did get a Mexican pizza, and it was because my buddy who was in the hospital wanted some uh, Taco Bell or Mexican food, but there was no Mexican restaurants near that hospital. And... It was, I remember spending like almost $30 and 
and I got a Mexican pizza. He got like a, a steak quesadilla and like a burrito and maybe a taco. It was like 30 bucks. We literally could have gone um, to a sit down Mexican restaurant for that kind of money. And so, yeah, when, when everyone, everyone's like, you want to go to Taco Bell? It's like, not, not if there's another option, which is sad because growing up, let's say I'm like 12, Taco Bell used to just taste better. Now, that could be 12-year-old brain, but I honestly think the quality was just better. And uh, so, yeah, I, I try everything I can to avoid Taco Bell at this point, which is, which is a bummer. And I was, I was even being, you know, I was being an old man yesterday with Randy and Zenzo and I I had taken a picture and it was of the candy at, uh, you know, it was the candy at the checkout at Home Depot because I was filming a video, I had to run and get some parts and like the king size or the shareable size or whatever was there, it was 348. And I'm just thinking, you know, when I went back in my day, when I was young, that would have been like a dollar. And at some point, it got more expensive. And and I didn't buy it at a dollar, by the way. I was a guy that bought the normal for 50 cents when I was younger. And even still, like, it's been getting more and more expensive. And at some point where I wasn't watching, somehow these larger candy bars became $3.50. And am I, I just, I'm shocked that is anybody still buying those? Like, I don't think people will be like, I buy them all the time. Cause you're kind of admitting you're paying a crazy amount for candy bar. And then they had like, uh, some gum above it. And I don't know what it was. It was like, uh, some minty gum that comes in a container. It was five eighty, And I'm just thinking, who, who, who was like, yeah, this is a good idea. Now I understand that, uh, Home Depot is not exactly the epicenter for good deals on candy. And that's a convenience item and all that. But, you know, it just, it's getting crazy out there. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Why can't companies make a heater that lasts forever? They used to make really long lasting ones like the Eheim. Why does your heater eventually stop working properly? Uh, so that's a misnomer. First, ours doesn't eventually to stop working properly like everything does as in nothing will run forever we are just willing to tell you about it so like it would be way better for us business wise to just release a heater and just never tell you to check on it because honestly in most people's homes they don't even need a heater however we trying to be responsible Aquarius which there's like 20% of the internet that thinks like this is some evil scam to make more money, but it's not, but you know, so let's put that aside. After two years, the current model will display an led and that led tells you, Hey, this thing's now two years old. Keep an eye on this thing because the longer you use something, the more likely it is to get worn out and maybe break. Now, does that mean our heaters go bad at two years? No. Does that mean our heater goes bad at 50 years, 10 years, 22 years? Maybe. All of these things depend on how much you use them. So let's put it into something that everybody uses every day, right? Let's pretend you sell shoes and I say, how long do these shoes last? What's your answer? Guess what? It depends on how you're using them. Are you using them to skateboard? They wear out really fast. Are you walking 50,000 steps a day? They're going to wear out really fast. Are you rock climbing in these things? They're going to wear out really fast. Are you only using them to go to the mailbox and back twice a week? They're going to last till the end of time, right? Oh, are you getting them wet? They're leather. You, you get them wet and then you let them dry out and then you get them wet and you let them dry out and they eventually just rot away, right? So now imagine that the shoe company goes, hey, we think if you were using this as a running shoe, it'll last you about eight months. And then you've got the faction of people, oh, they're selling shoes. They only last eight months. My last one's lasted me 26 years. Man, you'd have to be dumb to buy those. Meanwhile, 
they're not using them at the same intensity. They're not using them the same way. They're not taking care of them. They're doing this or doing that. So when it comes to heaters, like why aren't we making uh, heaters that last forever? Don't we have the technology? We 100% do. We don't have buyers. You go, I'd buy them. Oh, they're $9,000. Oh, well, I, that, that's, that's dumb. Yeah, it is. Now, are they nine grand? No. But you truly want a heater. Most people won't even buy a backup heater. Most people beyond that don't buy a temperature controller. Most people beyond that don't even buy a thermometer. So when you when you're and you when you're looking at this, you're going, I do, I do. That guy over there does. She does. Everybody in this chat is not who heaters are made for. We all own aquariums. I get it. But for every person that is on YouTube watching a video, there's a thousand people that wander into a Petco, a PetSmart, a chain, a whatever, and just go, oh, I need a heater. This one's $11. Why wouldn't I buy that one? Or a Walmart or whatever. And probably 12% of them aren't even sold to Aquarius. What do you mean, Corey? Oh, got to go in my turtle tank. Oh, got to go in my pond outside. Got to do my thing. Got to make... Oh, I'm making a, a snake uh, egg incubator. And I need to keep the water warm so it'll do a thing, right? Oh, I need to do this. And so when that's the majority of the market that is shopping purely based on price, the easiest thing to do to compete is to make yours cheap. Now, then you go, why is there someone being the counter to it? You also still have the everlasting gobstopper problem or gobstopper problem. And that is, Eheim and Tetra both ran into this. They made filters and heaters and things like that that were so good, they would last 20 years. And you know what happened? They almost went out of business because if you're an Aquarius, like we're Aquarius here in this, in this chat, we own, okay, I own five aquariums. I buy five heaters for 70 bucks each, let's say, and they last me 20 years. Well, there's not enough people entering the hobby to keep that production going. So you go out of business. Now, if they fail, you buy another one. And it's a big game of what's the price, how long will it last, and when can you sell another one? That's that game that everybody's playing. Could, do we have the technology? Yes. You know what the real technology is? Heat the room. Real simple. I do it in my fish room all day long. Most real breeders heat the space. My warehouse, heat the space. My fish store, heat the space. We have the technology. Everyone goes, well, that costs too much money. You're right. It does. And so you want to, you want to never have a heater problem again, heat your entire room and then have a backup, right? And you're going to go, well, okay. If I use a furnace, that furnace install, my furnace install was $14,000. Now have a backup on hand. 28 grand for a couple of fish tanks, you won't do it. Maybe you do an oil heater. Okay, an oil heater in the room, and I got another one. Like, that's doable. That's only like 100 bucks with backup. Then you're going to go, but the bill is killing me, right? And then you've got the fact that we're just mixing water and electronics and humans. As a total population, humans, we're real dumb. Real dumb. In that, well, yeah, I did a water change. I let it sit out of the water. Oh, I dropped it. Oh, I nudged it. Oh, I shipped it through the mail and took a bonk. Oh, I did this. Oh, I did that. I got crazy hard calcium. Oh, I let algae dry up and crust onto it. Oh, I got an Oscar beating it with a hammer. I got this. I got that. You got all these things going on. And, uh, yeah. So if it was easy, there would be a company right now that would just do it. One, so, yeah, We would do it. But I can't even find a manufacturer that exists that is trying for longevity. We are continually working with our manufacturers to go for longevity. We So most heaters don't have error codes. We do. Luval does. Why do we have error codes? So that you can report back to us. When something goes wrong, we try to have the circuit board that's on there detect what went wrong. Then it can tell us. Ooh, I've got an E8 problem. Ooh, I've got an H2 problem. That lets us know, ooh, did this temp did the, the the sensor go bad for the temperature? 
Did it overheat? Did it stop turning on? Like, it, ooh, we're not heating up. X amount of time went by and it never got past this temperature. We're collecting all of that data and then we give it back to the manufacturer and go, 11% of the defects we had were because of this problem. Can we fix that? What could we do? Could we, uh, could we make the heater a little bigger? Could we change the way people use it? Tell them to put circulation by it. And I find it hilarious that collectively we want a heater that will never break. And the first thing we do when we do things to help that is we fight it. So we sold flu wall heaters for many years. And one of the, the biggest things that heaters encounter is overheating. And so the flu wall heater has a error code that says LF, low flow, right? And the, if you go read the reviews on it, the biggest thing people hate is I had a heater for 20 years, works fine. All my heaters never had, never had this LF problem. This is so dumb, flu wall. This is the first heater that told them they were doing it wrong. That's the reality, right? So you had a heater, you put it over there, it lasts for 17 months, burns out, you buy another one, it lasts for 22 months, you buy another one, lasts for 11 months. Then you buy the Fluval digital heater, you put it in the same spot and it goes, blink, LF, 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 LF. What the hell? This thing doesn't work right at all. I'm returning. I am so angry. I never had this problem. And it's telling you the flow is low and therefore it is going to prematurely fail. And yet the public's first thing is this thing is broken, not the way I never had the problem. And so that is one of the angles right there is that designing something to actually work really well is difficult when the user won't do best practices. And that stems from a long time of marketers and companies abusing the customer, right? You know, we say, hey, you should get an oil change every 3,000 miles, and then we launch synthetic oil, and it actually should be longer, but we're still like, we like that money, you know? And then the car market switches to, you know what? Free lifetime oil changes, and magically, oh, no, 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 like every 8,000 miles, not 3,000, oh, no, 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 no. And then they, they switch again, they switch again, they switch again. And so this distrust of companies is built up over a long period of time. And so when you get someone like us, where we're going, hey, we just want you to know when your heater is two years old. Why? Is it going to fail tomorrow? No, we just want you to, you've got 11 aquariums. Can you remember the day you set that up? Are you keeping logs? Probably not. You're like me. Or you plugged it in and you ran it for six months and then you put it in a drawer and you pulled it out two years later and you plugged it in again. And you did this one. And you did that one. You, you bought this one. You know, what? there's people that buy used heaters. I bought it at the auction. The, the bare minimum, I think, is we can at least tell you like, hey, look, it's been running for two years. Keep an eye on it. It's, you know, to me, it's that that bumper to bumper warranty on a car. Like, hey, we'll warranty it for like 100,000 miles. And after that 100,000 miles, not that it stops working. It's that, okay, some things are going to have wear and tear, Right. And so that's, I think that's why we don't have a heater that will last forever yet. People won't pay the price. People aren't conditioned to following the things. They don't like to be inconvenienced at all. And so hopefully companies like us and Fluval and other companies will continually try to make better versions of their product. That is the goal. And maybe someday I got a heater last 27 years and hopefully we're selling so much other stuff we don't got a business because our heaters last forever and they only ever need one. What do I think about saltwater heaters and freshwater? I've been researching the titanium ones and wondering if they're built differently or are they specific to so saltwater only? They're exact same. I literally, with our heaters, they go, do you want quartz? Do you want glass? Do you want titanium? Do you want stainless? Do you want this? Do you want this? Do you want this? They don't care. They literally don't care. They literally go, oh, yeah. In some markets, this one sells really well. Like, okay, they literally don't care. The internals, they don't care. Everything is the same. We have to go in and go, yes, but, but what can you do to make it cost more and last longer? And they go, but no one asked for that. They asked, how is it cheaper? And we go, we know. What, you know. So when they go, which one do you want to use? We go, well, which one will last the best? Which one will be the best? And they'll spout something out and we'll try it. And we go, mm, that's not very good at all, right? 
So we end up testing a lot of stuff. And in my opinion, there is no difference between them. Our heater could have been, uh, could have been stainless steel, could have been titanium and put put a big old air quotes around titanium. Titanium is stupid expensive. So you're, you know, it's one of those things like, well, I think titanium was in the room when they built that thing. So therefore it's titanium. Like it's kind of like the iPhone iPhone 15 is titanium. And if you've watched any of the things like, sure, titanium. And the reality is that titanium is a worse metal than the stainless steel from the version before it. So then you go, oh, why not make a heater out of stainless steel? Yeah, maybe. What about glass? What about quartz? What about the internals? And the thing is, you can have something where like, oh, stainless steel, super duper hardy, can use it like a baseball bat. Great doesn't transfer heat as well or doesn't allow it to cool down fast enough or is interfering like if you heat that metal up right the metal holds heat it tricks the sensor longer where glass like oh that cools down pretty quick and you'll get more real-time feedback so everything you choose about a product you build will have a an effect on another part right well if you do this we're gonna have to do that and if you do this you're gonna have to do that and so you're also still at the end of it all whether it's whatever material you pick you're at the you're at the mercy of the weakest part right usually that's gonna be the seal between the casing and the electronics you could build it out of steel that's 10 inches thick but if that seals not great doesn't matter it's gonna fail right and so you're doing all of these things and the public, they want a heater that's smaller. They want to put it on its side. They want to bury it under the substrate. They want to, they, you know, they want to leave it at the store. Like if I just pay for it and leave it here, can it just heat my tank? And what we know from longevity standpoint, it needs to be bigger. It needs to have great flow. It needs to not be horizontal. It needs to be vertical. And so you have to make these things. So like we, how do we do that? People want a smaller heater, but we know it lasts longer if it's bigger. We built a U-shaped heater. So the tube spreads out the heat like it's a longer heater, but it's in a smaller package, right? So there's all these things we build, we build to try and please people while keeping it affordable. If we were building to just make the best one ever and not be affordable, we could probably do that. There's $300 heaters that'll last you the rest of your life. We'll sell 28 of them a year. Be great for the people that need them. Corey, my shipping is expensive. Why? Because shipping is expensive. Yeah. We lose money on every package we've ever shipped. So when you go, it's $8. Yep. Costs us $22 to ship it to you. But other companies also do that. Like, yep, it sucks. Shipping is the worst part right now. That's why you're seeing Amazon fall apart. You're seeing all these companies fall apart because shipping has gotten so insane and we as customers, and I say we, not you, we, me, we expect fast shipping. We expect it to be free. We expect all these things about it. And the reality is nothing in the world is free. So what most companies do and what we do not do is they just put it on the product. That's where you see things like, why is this phone case $74? Because they're baking in all the shipping. That, you know, it's like, this thing's a piece of plastic. And so we could do that. Like a sponge filter, you know, people, this this happens the most, right? People order something from us, decide they don't want it. They go to ship it back to us and they lose their minds. The shipping's $29 on this. And we go, yeah, that's what we paid to get it to you. We got a discount because we're shipping a lot. We only paid like 22 but that's why we have the policy of like, if you buy something and you just chose the wrong size or whatever, if there's nothing wrong with it, it's on you to ship it back because it will cost you more to ship it back than it will for the product. And so outside of us telling you to keep it and everyone just taking advantage of us all the time, if you buy an $8 bag of food, I guarantee you it costs me $12 to ship it to you. The cheapest, we can ship an item out of our warehouse right now is the cheapest way, not the average, the cheapest way is $10 now. It's like 10.20. So when you go, ah, I just like one of these, 
He'll give us $11, $3 for this, or I think it's four or three or four, whatever it is, $3.49, and $8 shipping, and then we're going to ship it. I will have lost money. So, and that's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's not my fault. It's not anyone's real fault. It just, stuff's got to get around. And so, instead of going, well, this thing is, uh, you know, this is $10 in free shipping. It's $7, or it's $3, and shipping's 8 and so you're gonna you're gonna see that happen a lot in the next coming years. We're we're seeing it right now. If you're if you're hanging out in the business groups, lots of businesses have been around for 10 years. In the last two months, have seen numbers falling 50, 60, 70 percent of their sales are gone. Money's drying up. You're seeing tactics now starting to be used. I, I see one of our competitors every week something else is 25 plus percent off. Those are desperation tactics. Got to get money in the door today to pay my employee today. We'll worry about tomorrow, tomorrow. And so we look at that going, okay, we're a company of 31 people. We're designing products. We're doing these massive long projects. We need to uh, do things ahead of time and make calculated decisions. And what people won't realize is that like, There's periods in business where you're just unprofitable. Oh, we're moving. We're doing a thing. We're doing this. We're doing that. Summer, for instance, we basically lose money because we don't have enough orders coming in, but then it gets really busy in January. So we need the trained staff. And so you're going to watch a lot of people really struggle in business, including us. And you'll be struggling too. You know, there'll be downsizing and all that kind of stuff going around and it'll be terrible for everybody. But shipping is what shipping is. And uh, we can't just take a knowing huge loss every day. And there are days you take big losses in business, and that's not fun. So we, so the one thing I can guarantee you is shipping with us will never be a profit center. That, those are words that shouldn't exist. But there is a big, you know, a sizable chunk of business owners that think you can turn shipping into a profit center. And what that means is you find a product that ships cheap enough. So like, let's say I I ship this pen. This is an aquarium caught pen. And you can ship it in an envelope. And if I charge you $5 in shipping, it only cost me two, I made $3. So that's why you see like when you, when people used to have cable, right? Oh, for just three payments of $2 for this Cuisinart thing, like, wow. And shipping's $11. They found a way in which the shipping will pay for more than the item is. And that used to be a long running thing for many, many years on, on the late night infomercials, you know, like, Oh, look at the sham. Wow. Shipping's only $12. Meanwhile, that sham well takes 32 cents to make. And yeah, you're buying two of them for two bucks and you can get two more for two more bucks. So you're into it for 17 bucks and the shipping on those sham wells is three bucks. They're making a huge profit. Now with us, We have the worst products, big old bulky sponge filters, heavy one pound containers of easy green that can leak. So we got to give them extra protection. We got stuff. We got to wrap in bubble wrap. We got live plants. They're going to need a a heat pack and a liner. And that's all got to ship together and not explode on the way there. We have all these challenges. And so uh, that's the way it's going to be. And we've taken the uh, stance of, we won't be the right place to shop for everybody, but the people that do, we will take care of you. We will listen to you. We will help educate you. We will make sure it's right. And we will try to do it at the, not the cheapest price, because we're not trying to be the cheapest. We will try to do it at the price that will keep us in business so that we can warranty that product three years from now, so that we can take care of you in the future. And so it's not our goal to be super cheap and unprofitable. Our goal is to be profitable pay living wages, have good products, and be around for a very, very long time, no matter what the economy is doing. And so we price our stuff accordingly. That allows us to give us some stuff away sometimes too, which is nice. Yeah, Shrimp Sanctuary says, I ship the U.S. One pound from Singapore to the U.S. is $66. Yep. Yep. Have I considered talking to Lowell's Fish Lab about injection molding the 3D printed version of Dean's fry tray? Uh, Not lately. He sent 
myself and Dean some, and I gave them all to Dean, and they, they're on version like 12 at this point. Uh, but no, we haven't talked anything lately about um, switching over to like a mass production thing. We're actually, if anything, I'm trying to get that guy more money. He's uh, He's developed a product I think people like. He's made it better and better and better and better. At one point, he was going to sell the plans, and I go, ah, oh, if you sell the plans, I don't think you're ever going to get your money out of it. And not that everyone's got to get rich, so I'm not saying that. But if he was to you know, make a little bit of money on this thing, he would keep making it better. He would develop more products and stuff, and I think that's really cool in the 3D printed community. And so if you just sell the plan, people start sharing the plans, and pretty soon you're never, you know, you're never going to make any money, and it's not going to be worth your time to make a better version. So if you can find a way of like, yeah, make them and then sell them like on Etsy or something, I think that's the model to go. And I'm not, and, and maybe, maybe sells that design to, you know, someone like you, maybe you buy it and then you crank them out and you sell them, whatever it is. But I'm trying to encourage him to get the best version and, uh, keep, keep some of that in house and work with it. When do the shipping rates go up again or did it already happen? It's already happened, Matt. Don't worry. Most people didn't even notice. They just go, ah. And and still, if you buy 80 bucks worth of stuff, your shipping is free. I don't think people realize that, that there are there are plenty of orders where you order $80 where shipping is more than 40 of the dollars. Most people don't realize that a four-foot light costs $42 to ship alone. So imagine you got a light, you got some easy green, you got some other stuff. There's there's times when I, I look through and I go, what did we spend $100 on shipping for one order? Oh, they bought two lights and this thing, and they live in Hawaii. I, I can say this. In a meeting this, this week, and this is going to be lame to hear if you live in these two states, we are going to add a surcharge to Hawaii and Alaska. I don't know what the number is yet. We're still running numbers, but... Uh, there are, it is so crazy costly to ship there for us that we're losing money. Basically, if you order, we lose money. And so we're going, okay, well, it's, you know, it's going to be 10 bucks or less, I think, which is not great. You're going to go shipping is $18. But the problem is when we ship there, it's so expensive. And we're, you know, we don't stay in business if we just keep shipping stuff at a loss. So, and I think people know, you know, when you live in those, like there's a lot of companies, we, we've been doing research, right? Lots of major brands, they just won't even ship to Hawaii and stuff like that because it's, they don't, they don't want to look bad. Oh, I got to charge them too much. And it's still going to be, we haven't figured out how to get the messaging, right? Because on the website, it's like, hey, it's $7.99 or $79.99 free shipping. And then if you live in one of those two States, you're going to get there and be like, what is this surcharge? This is BS. Let me email customer service and yell at them. Or, you know, and so most companies, they just go, you know what? We're just not going to ship there. Don't need it. We only have on average between uh, like two to four orders a day from those states. So it's a very small amount of our overall, you know, we ship three to 500 orders a day. That being said, we literally have a meeting about two to four orders a day going, well, let's make sure we're as fair as we can be. Is there any alternative? We still went back to our shipping carriers and said, hey, is there anything else we can do before we have to do this? And so we're still in those talks. They're seeing what they can do. So the price hasn't gone up yet. But when it does, know that, you know, it, it won't be because we wanted to. We don't make any more money off of it. We're going, how much can we stomach to, to give up to make this happen? And so my whole goal really is that over the years, we've been on YouTube for 10 years now, when I tell you we had to do something, hopefully with all my previous interactions we've ever had, you know, Corey wouldn't have done that unless he had to do it. I don't like, I want the hobby to be cheaper. I want you to use that filter you have in the closet instead of buying one from us. I want you to help save the planet. I want you to not spend your money. But if you do, I want you to spend it with us. But first, I want you to not spend it. I want you to enjoy nature. I want you just to live a great life. But if there's something that causes you to go out of that loop, hopefully you'll remember us and go, hey, you know what? I could buy it from them. 
All right. I always plan on spending over a hundred bucks, but your products are worth it. Yeah. And Laura, so I see Laura, you're not a member. One of the easiest things you could do to get a little more value, become a member. If you became a member, it costs you five bucks a month. You will then save 5% or more, by the way, on the website. So you save 5% on all, all normal stuff, but we have the scratch and dent stuff, and there's a few items in the member-only section that are a little bit more discounted. Uh, and so people are spending 100 bucks at a time. You really kind of you see that value. So the discussion on shipping sounds like 2019, 2020 all over again. Yeah. The reality is we're, we're not going back. More people working from home. Uh, more and more every year, the online retail space grows. And so when it's like, oh yeah, 5% more stuff got bought this year online than in store. What happens is that's 5% more on all the carriers, on all the roads. And so when you go, well, I live in a town with this population, did they grow by 5%? Did they expand the roadways? gas got more expensive? Did they hire 5% more personnel? And the reality is, no, that doesn't scale. Usually legs behind. And so uh, I think today or tomorrow in this week, uh, what do you call it? Um, the holiday surge pricing goes into effect. So all those prices I were quoting actually go up this week because now we're in the holiday times. Basically, from now until like January 15th, all the extra returns and buying for uh, basically Black Friday, Cyber Monday, uh, Christmas, all of this stuff creates an overwhelming demand on our infrastructure system throughout the United States, probably the world. And so they got to cost them more money, so they charge us more money. And on average, we don't charge you more money. So there's at least that. Yep, every time gas prices go up, shipping goes up, but it never comes down. It's kind of true. Yeah. This we've seen this problem. Uh we've seen this problem since 2019. And so that's why we started getting into stores. Our hope is that we can keep finding ways to get it to your stores cheaper and better. So that you have a 10 minute drive, you go buy a brand new fish you love, grab our products off the shelf, support a small local business, support a non-local but small business online at the same time. We give you education and all of that, and that works awesome, even with the shipping, right? And so what we what we were banking on is that, yes, shipping is always going to go up. That's just going to be a thing. But proportionally, when you ship stuff like on a pallet and that kind of stuff, it doesn't go up as much because it's very efficient compared to these small boxes going all around the world or all around the country. If I can ship a pallet of stuff to a store and you guys go to the store, yes, your gas will cost more. But hopefully you're going there anyway because you get to buy fish and plants and have a good time and chat with other fish nerds. And so it's, you know, that's, that's a more fun experience, I think. And so we are continually trying to help more and more stores, get in more stores. And it's not to make more money. A lot of people think that's the driving goal. And in the business, not. It's to actually help mom and pop stores and get you more one-on-one -on -one help. So when you're in the store, you can ask for help. If they're doing better, they're paying their employees better, which means they're getting better help, which means you're getting better service, which means everything gets better. All right. I didn't get my one-year coin with my latest order. You only get coins the second time you order after reaching a milestone. It's a limitation of our system. When you place an order, the system goes, are you past the one year or the two year or the three year, whatever it is? And if the answer is yes, it goes, great. Here's a tag on your account. Next time you order, it will then, when you check out, It'll go, how long have you been a member? Oh, it's still a month. You already have that tag. Okay. Oh, you have the tag. Add the coin. So there was, there's no way currently that we could, with the developers, where we could make that all happen simultaneously. 
before the limitation of the API calls. It's that's nerdy talk for you can't use way too much time to do it. Otherwise, uh, there you could hack it. So it's like you've got this much time. You got to make these calls. You got to make it happen and do all that stuff. And you only got so much time to do it. Uh, let's see here. Would there be any possible savings for a ship it whenever type of option? 95% of the time I'm ordering supplies I don't need quickly. Yeah, uh, there's the problem is there's not. So maybe growing up like me, when you go to the post office, they're basically like, well, how fast does it need to get there? And they'd be like, here, this one's $4, $9, $12, $112. $12. Now it's much more like, um, Oh, you want this to go somewhere? Yeah, it's uh, 19, 19, 22, 21, 50, or $23. So, and then the, the $19, like there's no insurance, no guarantee, nothing. And so the options have really shrunk a bunch to, at, at most, there we could save like a, a buck or two, maybe. And sometimes that doesn't even happen. So, we look at that and we thought about, should we offer a way that they could ship slower if they chose to? But when we look at it, we're like, it actually, I don't think it's actually going to save any money. Because even, you know, a lot of people will also check it, like, just let it ship it slow. It can't ship it slow. It's got a plant. Or you might say ship it slow and it's like, oh, it actually can't ship that way because you've got a lithium ion product in it. Or ship it slow. Oh, it can't ship that way. You have a liquid in it. So there's always like, there's all these rules to each shipping type. That's why whenever you go to the post office, they're like, what do you have in there? And then they go, okay, well, you could be these ones then. Why don't we ship to Europe? Uh, mostly because we're out of warehouse space and international, uh, what do they call it? Like VAT taxes and all that kind of craziness is insane. And then the average person loses their mind after about seven days. Any shipping over more than seven days, whether in the U.S. or not, you start melting down. And it's because we're all used to getting stuff fast. And so we want to find a partner there, basically. And shipping stupid expensive. Yeah. Where, like, a you know, I just, like, the top of my head, like, oh, one pound to Australia. Oh, it's $48 shipping. So it's like, we want to ship Easy Green. It weighs a pound. Uh-oh. That means the $20 bottle of Easy Green is $68 just to get it there. That ain't great. No one likes that. Need to start your own transport trucks? You laugh, but we've looked into it. We almost bought a semi-truck and a trailer so that we could pick our own containers up from the port because it's so expensive and so often they're short on drivers or chassis or whatever it is. We, we had meetings about it. And we ended up not quite pulling the trigger. It was actually going to be my silent business partner that was going to run that part, which is good now that, you know, he can't do that. But, you know, we, we, we look at everything. I mean, we have a team of 31 people and we have weekly meetings and the people in my company are wicked smart and we come up with problems. We see it. And then we go, well, what are solutions? And then we revisit it in six months. Did we find any new solutions to this problem? There's problems that plague us for years that eventually we get to solve. But if we don't, you know, we not everything is solvable yet. So looking for a partner in Canada yet? We have one. April's Aquariums. Yep. Remember when shipping was six to eight weeks and there was no other option? Yeah. I remember ordering, like, you can order CDs out of, like, the catalog and... You'd get them like two months from then. If you guys partner up with Big Al's in Canada, the products would be so much more accessible. I've talked to so many that don't buy Easy Green because it's only available at April's. Yeah. I don't know anything about uh, about Big Al's. They haven't approached us. We could say the same thing, though. Like, well, wait, what if, why don't you just put your stuff on Amazon? Why don't you put it in Petco and PetSmart and Chewy's and Costco and this? Because not everybody's got the same work ethic. And controlling price, that's a problem too. There's all a lot of factors. Are we still working with Akahuna? Yeah. 
maybe next well one of the weeks coming up we even have a tour video coming out we are indeed i believe that accordion co-op would pick up your own containers at the dock yeah you have to get special uh special i don't know if it's permitting licensing you have to you have to go through a bunch of background checks and all this stuff because you're going down and if you pick up the wrong container on purpose or not you're like yeah, we're here to pick up Aquarium Co-op. Actually, I'm picking up a container of iPhones and just running with it. So you got to have a lot of security clearances to actually get to that part of the port where you're having the ability to remove containers. So I've used Pirate Ship for shipping. Australia is $15.99 for one pound. I don't believe you. Actually, let me look. Let's see here. Let's see if I can find their chart. Mm. Package be any type of regular cardboard box. Maximum length is 22 inches. Can't be more than 36 inches total. So that's so that's the problem right there. So Here's a great example where someone goes, I've done a thing, and therefore you're wrong. And then I go, well, maybe, maybe my team of people and the three years we've been working on this were real dumb. Instead, it's in the middle here. And that is, so the package can be any regular cardboard box, custom or not. Maximum length is 22 inches in any one dimension. This is getting real shipping nerdy, by the way. But it has to be length plus height plus width cannot be more than 36 inches total. That is a pretty limiting box, right? So like you got 12 this way, you got 12 this way, 12 this way, that's like a foot. You can't fit very much in there. So even though you can have four pounds in that, when you put that together, you're like, wait, that's only like a couple of sponge filters? Or... Sometimes you're not even that. It's like a sponge filter plus, I'm trying to think of a product that's like oblong, like uh, like this thing. I got to fit that in there. And when you really start measuring stuff, you'll measure this and you'll be like, oh my gosh, this is 12 and a half inches, won't fit in the box. Or you measure it with, uh, you know, and you're like, I need to put some, some padding around it. Well, it's not going to fit in the box. And so then you got to go and play the box game of, okay, I need a 14 inch long box, but only 10 inches tall, but this and this and this. Uh, let's see here. The simplest international shipping rates ever. Yeah. And so I will say that here's one of the problems you run into. Let's say our average shipping is six pounds. Every country, I wonder if I can still see this. Let me see what the rates were. Because we had this where we started limiting what people could order. Like, you can't order more than four pounds. And they'd be like, why Why is it not working? And then we'd tell them, like, oh, yeah, the next step up is huge. Let me see if I can see it, if we still have our zones. Uh, or do they all get deleted? Let me see if they're just deactivated or, oh, wait. Four more countries and regions. Can I look? Let's see. Australia. Nope. That's the regions, but it's not saying the prices that we had. Darn it. Mm. Let's see if that's it. Nope. Still not going to show us. Let's see what five pounds is. Let's see if it shows us what five pounds is. Have I tried subsidizing your revenue by offering specialized digital consulting and service to other local hobby retailers, not just fish keeping? We did that way at the beginning. So I used to offer, uh, at the very beginning, it was $50 an hour. And then it was $100 an hour. And what happened was more people would book than there was time in the day. So I couldn't work in my own company anymore. And then you're like, well, this increased the price. So then you also had the problem that uh, people would be late or not show up. And then they get angry. We're like, well, yeah, it's, you know, it's $100, but I, I, I forgot that I had to pick up my kid. And it's like, yeah, but I was there and waiting. You just got to lose your 100 bucks. And so it wasn't, wasn't very fun. Interesting. 
So it's $35.99 to ship four pounds, but they won't tell me what's over four pounds. But I remember it being, let's, let's try five pounds. Let's try five pounds. Uh, let's see here. Well, that's the same chart. This is all the same. But yeah, so even in that example, like if it's two bottles of Easy Green, that'll be, so like the box itself is probably six ounces and then you got the packing material. So that'll be uh, two bottles of Easy Green would hit the three pound mark. To ship that to Australia would be $26.99. So not, not the price I originally quoted, but I do believe at like pound five, six, and seven, it starts going up crazy amounts. And every country was different. And then there was the whole handoff and the fact that sometimes it would take three weeks to get to Australia. Do your partner stores selling your items have the right to raise prices? Yes. They can sell them for as much as they want, but I think it's a dumb idea. I tell them that all the time. Because... Uh, if I'm selling this Easy Green for 20 bucks and you want to sell it for 25, you might sell it to them in the store the first time. And then once they learn I sell it for 20 bucks online, they're going to buy it from me. And our goal is that you would keep buying it from them. And there will be some people loyal to their local store. Uh, but I, I don't want to put the customers in that situation of like, I'd save a bunch of money. They're already in that situation from the discount. If you're a member, you get a discount from us. Not all of our RPP stores also offer that discount. Now, that's only 5%, so that's a little more you can stomach that. But now imagine that it's $25 there, and they don't offer the discount, but you could buy it online with a 5% discount, right? So now it's $19 versus $25. In theory, you're going, oh, we got to pay shipping at Aquarium Co-op. It's like, well, if you were buying $80 worth, there is no shipping. So it becomes this weird quagmire and we try to control the things. We basically say you can't sell under this amount because we don't want it to be a giant bidding war because guess who will win? This guy. I make the product. I will win every time. I don't want you, I don't want the stores to have to battle me. I also don't want to have the stores to have to battle somebody else. So instead it's like, this is the price. You could sell it for more knowing that you're going to hurt your, make it harder on yourself, but you're choosing to make it harder. Do we have a 3PL in Canada? No. In our experience so far in our research, 3PLs are terrible. They take forever to ship out. They make lots of mistakes or, or way more than we do. I guess maybe lots of a. It depends. All right. I don't do the discounted local store. Kind of a tip, I guess. Yeah, you guys, you guys are free to do whatever you want. I try to control so that our people don't lose. And that's our customers. And that's our, you know, our customers is you. It's also the store. And I'm trying to make sure that everybody, you know, I don't even like to see it where they're doing temporary deals. It's not that I don't want you guys to ever get a deal. It's that, so imagine we had two stores in a city and one keeps putting Easy Green at 25% off and it's always 25% off. You're going to buy your Easy Green from there. Eventually, that might hurt the other store that's there enough that they go out of business. And then they can go, guess what? Easy Green's $25. We don't want to encourage that. We want instead for it to be like, how about you both sell it $20 and may the best customer service, the best selection of fish, the friendliest smile win. Right? So that way, like, oh, I'm going to Target. That's by this store. I'll pick it up. Oh, I'm going to Costco over here. That's by this store. I'll pick it up there instead of a race to the bottom where they both lose. My local fish stores aren't great. Anyone have any suggestions for online retailers in the UK? I don't know if I know any. Would I consider pea puffers to be an intermediate fish or a hard fish to keep? I think I'd put it more in the intermediate I think they're actually fairly easy to keep. They do really well on, on frozen foods, but it's all on a spectrum. If keeping a neon tetra was crazy hard for you to keep alive, 
then that would be a little more intermediate. But if it was super easy, then maybe you're going, ah, pea puffers are super easy. Everyone's got their own journey on where they are. But I wouldn't say they're hard. I, I would say that maybe they're a little harder than something easy, but they're not that much different. Do we have any stores in Chicago? Probably, I don't know. Let me look. We have this rad retail partner store, Finder. Let's see, Chicago. We have one. Ocean Design Aquarium. Shout out at 7542 West Addison Street, Chicago, Illinois. Boom. Open Monday to Wednesday, 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. Close Thursday, 12 to 6 on Friday, 12 to 4 on Saturday, 12 to 4 on Sunday. There you go. Now, and I, I am working on getting you guys more and more of those links, but do yourself a favor. If you've never looked, type in your zip code and just see, like, do I have a local store? It's fun to find new local stores. I love it. Because we've got one opening up in Washington. I was like, i got to stop by there. Who knows? And not like I want to sell all my crap, but mostly like, what if they got rad cool fish that I don't know about? That's why I go to stores. I want to see rad cool fish. Uh, let's see here. To ship a package internationally, the total size of the package consideration. Be sure that what you're shipping is allowed into the country. You also need the export paperwork. Yep. Yep. Some countries we have to provide MSDS on every product. Some countries we just have to classify them with different country codes for tax purposes. Some of them need a copy in the box and outside of the box. There is a laundry list of stuff that has to go down, which makes that's why we don't just do it easy. Nova Tropicals finally made the list. Got my aquarium co op from April's Aquarium. I am making a trip. Maybe you'll see me. I'm, I'm making a trip to April's Aquarium this month. No, next month. We're just going to try and, you know, check out the store because it's a beautiful store. Maybe film a little bit, have dinner with the owner, uh, and then maybe set up an event down the road. But I want to experience the store because I don't get to experience the store. If we do an event, it's just all people want to talk. And I, I just want to be a fish nerd going, what do you got down here? What's going on over there? What is this? But if I'm talking to people, I don't get to do that. So... I'm going to go be a hobbyist. Uh, let's see. I feel like people are blowing me up. Is it just... Oh, it's just Aqua Pros. Fish Tank Mike. Would Crip Pink Flamingos get enough light through dense Salvinia cover at my two-gallon Nano? I've got two 2.4-watt LEDs on it. Man, that is a hard question to answer. I say post a picture in our Facebook group and then I'll, because the wattage alone, so you've got five watts of energy. It's like, yeah, maybe, but if it's super dense, maybe not. How tall is the tank? Where's the placement? All these things kind of matter. And it's like on one hand, like one LED is five watts could be way too powerful. How many LEDs, what's the spread? All those things do kind of matter. Let's see. Whip World says an hour and 26 minutes away from me. Sounds like the perfect Saturday. Drive out somewhere. Go have a rad lunch. Grab a friend. Grab a friend. Make this a friend trip. Grab a buddy. Drive for an hour and a half. Grab rad lunch. Go shopping for an hour at the fish store. Make that fish owner's day. Then drive home. Maybe you get dinner somewhere on the way home with your buddy. And then you put your fish away. That sounds like a great Saturday. I miss those Saturdays, and I'm, I'm trying to put more of those Saturdays together, actually, because that's some of my best memories in the hobby were go somewhere and do something fishy. I did the Greater Seattle Aquarium Society this, this month. That was fun. Uh, is that it? I hung out with Mike, and I'm just trying to add more of that stuff. I, also, I think it's very important, too, having some other people to talk about fish with and what's new, what you saw, what they're into. Any experience trying to automate feeding of golden pearls or other fine powder food? 
I haven't yet. I fed a lot of golden pearls, but never through an auto feeder, I don't think. So I don't have a great experience there. I don't know, you know, do they clump after a while or anything like that? I know they can clump a lot when they're like vacuum packed, but I don't know if like a little bit of moisture causes them to clump a, a lot in the auto feeders. So I don't have that experience to share with you, unfortunately. Have you been to Fish Addicts in Vancouver? What was your opinion? I haven't been there yet. I don't think I've been to, I haven't been to a single fish store in Canada yet. Soon to change, I guess. Uh, let's see. Are Amazon puffers hard to keep? I don't think they're they're hard to keep. I do think you gotta feed them a lot of shelled food so they can trim down their puffer teeth. How do you stop glass surfing? One, I'm not convinced that's a problem. And two, uh, try changing flow patterns, decoration patterns, uh, other fish in the tank, those types of things. I'm doing that a bunch this week in the, well, I don't know if it's this week, but I'm ordering a bunch of that kind of stuff in the fish room. I ordered different canister filters. I ordered a Coralia wave maker. I ordered uh, lock line bendy outputs for the canister filters. I'm gonna try uh, directing the flow a little with a little more purpose, both in the 1500 gallon at the store expansion, the 800 gallon, and the 230 gallon. Those are the tanks where they're big enough. You can get some pockets of mold. Of like, I really would love to get that, you know, over to this. So like when it settles on a back corner in a 800 gallon tank, it's literally like that's five feet away. I can't reach it. Where if I can put some water flow back there and get it to the front corner, now it's only 40 inches away. I still can't reach it, but 40 inches is a lot better than five or six feet. Uh, and so I run into that with these big tanks that I'm trying to really direct flow a little more. And so I'm going to give it a chance. It's I spent, I don't know, like $250 on lock line parts, which, whew, not cheap. So hopefully I get the, the effect I'm going for. So debating if two co-op heaters for my 125 for my cross river puffer and two lights, or should I do three heaters? Now me personally, I know I can run a 125 with one 100 watt heater. But do you have glass tops? How cool or warm is the room normally? And do you want some redundancy? So I can, I can with a cross river puffer that's expensive, I can see the case of like, okay, maybe two, right? Two heaters. And I would set one of them to maybe 78 and I would set one of them to like 74. So basically one's just doing the lion's share work all the time. And if it ever, uh, one failed and didn't turn on, that second one should pick up the slack. And if it ever got stuck on, which hopefully it wouldn't, uh, the other one would never turn on. So I myself would not buy three. I would buy two. And I would set one much lower than the other one. I would also say you wouldn't be hurting to set them both up uh or maybe yeah both on inkbird or or temperature controllers it doesn't have to be inkbird but a lot of people use the inkbird ones would i use the med trio on bettas also have you found if hillstream loads are sensitive to the med trio uh in my experience they haven't been sensitive to the med trio for the hillstream loaches bettas i typically don't do the trio what you said everything what most times the bettas have never seen another fish since the day they were born. They get put into like a jar early, early, early in life. And when they arrive at a wholesale, they're in their own bag. And then they hit their own jar. And then they get to my store and they hit their own jar. And then they make it to your home in its own environment. Now, that's not always the case. And if I was going to treat... I would probably treat with uh, like a paracleanse or an antibiotic if their fins are all torn up. <coughs> but I wouldn't automatically hit them with the trio. I was literally going to take, I was, that's not my water bottle. Here we go. Have I ever been to Aquashella? <laughs> yes, I have. Like five of them. I haven't been to one this year, that's all. If you've never been and it's within driving distance, I highly recommend you go. In my opinion, if I could drive three hours or less, 
it's well worth the thirty some dollar ticket. I would do it every time it was near me. When you start going, well, I'd have to book a hotel room or I'd have to fly in. Then I start going, how big of a fish nerd are you? Because at three hours, I could take the wife, we go, we have a good time, we drive back, and the whole thing is like eight-ish hours. I don't have to hire a dog babysitter or anything like that. That's kind of a no-brainer. But once you got to do an overnight, who's taking care of the who's taking care of the dogs and who's doing this and that, and like oh, ten becomes this big thing. And it's not that it's not fun, but you need to be a dedicated hardcore fisher to get your value out of that. But if you're just kind of like, no, I'm enjoying it, like definitely go if it's local for sure. I'm in the UK. What is Aquashella? Aquashella is an industry event where they get let's call it a uh, hundred vendors both saltwater and freshwater, uh, and manufacturers, and they have like a kid's corner, they've got speakers, they've got all this stuff, and it's a two-day event normally, but it's kind of the same thing both days except for the speakers. You can show up, stand in a long line, get some free swag, and you got a chance to buy stuff from all these vendors, and you can see influencers that fly in for it, and it's kind of just a fun event. Now, there's other things around the world like uh, Vivarium, super duper cool also if you're going to be in the Netherlands, which you probably won't be, but uh, these events are really neat. But like for me, if I just wanted to fly there and back in a hotel room, I'm looking at like three grand. That is too much to be a fish nerd. I'd rather put that into my fish room, buy lock line and other expensive stuff. But if it was a three-hour drive and I just hop in my car, I go do it. I grab a fish nerd or two and my wife. We go have a fun time. We eat. And then we drive back. That sounds great. That is a wonderful Saturday or Sunday. And that I get behind all day long. You should do that. Uh, Let's see here. Would I be able to work with Aprils to put together a Canadian version of the Med Trio? Probably not. And here's why. It took me years, years to get the Med Trio going for the United States, basically. To do anything that would do justice, I would have to spend years working on that for Canada. And the honest part is, I would make no money doing it, and I've got a lot of commitments. Now... If April's Aquarium set out on that journey and they're like, we think we got it, we want some advice, will you try it, this and that, would I be would I be willing? Yeah, I'd, I'd weigh in on that. But I don't want to like develop this whole thing and just like, oh, the next five years of my life is focused on disease and fixing this when I don't have to and there's all this other stuff that's you know right in front of me I have to deal with. So it's not like I don't want to help. It's that I would be, by helping them, I'd be laying off my duties here, which is affecting all 31 families that work with us. You know, there's a lot of, not I don't want to say sleepless nights, but there's a lot of nights where I'm just kind of chilling and just thinking like, oh, I got 31 families relying on me not to screw this up. And not everything is controllable by me, but when you start looking like, what are the net elections going to look like? What, you know, is the economy, how's it doing right now? And you don't want to be the guy like, I, I hope I can run my career. And I'll be lucky enough to run my entire career till the day I am old and retire. And I never had to lay people off. That's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping that I never have to lay like a mass amount of people off. And so when I see things like, ooh, could get a little rough coming up, I triple down. And so I've been making more content than I've ever making. I've been in the fish room. I've been putting in more hours. Because if I do have to do that, I at least I want everybody to see there was nothing Corey could have done. Couldn't have couldn't have pedaled the bike any faster. Couldn't have done more. He gave it everything he could, and it still wasn't enough. Instead, you know, I don't want it to be because I've you know you hear about that stuff, and you don't want it to be like, well, the guy had his business, it was going pretty good, and then he started just always oh, always on the golf course, and then one day he realized he wasn't making money, and he went out of business. I hope that'll never be me. I, I hope I would never let it get to be that way, but instead, I want the polar opposite of like he was literally trying everything, and he was making all the right decisions, and they couldn't do it. And if if that's the way it is, so be it. 
Uh, let's see. Leo says, I'm doing two heaters, but I meant would it would one really cook the tank and stay on? So what happens with, with multiple heaters like that? If one fails and sticks on, so let me give you the example of like maybe my 800 gallon. If it's at 70 degrees and I want it to be 78, it might take a 100 watt heater two weeks to get it there, right? So it takes two weeks to heat up 800 gallons, eight degrees, like, wow, that, oof, I don't know. But then if that thing ever failed, right, and stuck on, I've got two weeks before it hits 86, right? So maybe I'm working on, oh, that's, oh, it's kind of warm in here. Or I see on the thermometer, like, hey, it's 82 in here. The fish would still be fine. But then I know, ooh, oh, the heater's on still. That Let me unplug that and swap it out. Now, when you have, let's say I have 300-watt heater, right? So I got a 300-watt heater. Three times as much watt. Instead of 14 days, divide that by three, right? Now it's only four or five days. I've only got four or five days to catch it before I cook my fish. So that's why I like using less wattage. You give yourself the maximum amount of time to go, oh, and... It, you could reach a point where maybe 100 watts could never get my tank to 90 degrees. Maybe it just never happen. You you may have run that into that in a garage tank where you put a 300 watt heater and you're like, no matter what I do, it can never get it past 74 because the heat's dissipating fast enough. And that's what I want. You know, if we're gonna if we're gonna fail catastrophically, I want as much time as I can. And so, catastrophic failure is failing on. If it fails to come on. Fish can handle that really well. We we ship fish all around the world all the time, and they handle lower temperatures. And in a home, as long as you have your home like, oh, I set my thermostat to 63 at night, it's pretty much never going to really get much below 62, 61 in that tank, even with the heater broken. And you've got a long time. It takes a while for that water to cool down. So I would like... Getting to 90 degrees and all your fish cooking and dying in the span of two hours, nothing you do about that. If it takes two weeks to get down to 60 degrees, you might still have 90% of your fish still alive. And you're like, why are they so sluggish? They're not eating. They stopped eating. They haven't eaten in four days because they're cold. <coughs> and so that's what you need. You need time. When there's a failure, you need time. And when heaters stick on at high wattages, you don't have the time. That's what I hate. That's why I'm always fighting people going, don't do the 500, the 700 watt heaters, the 400 watt heaters in your 75 gallon tank. Yeah, I can heat it up lickety split. It also kills them lickety split. Like there's, it's not, you know, it, it, it's to me, it's like giving a teenager a Ferrari. They'll never need that power. Give them the grandma mobile. They're still going to get into trouble. They're still going to make all the same mistakes, but They've got something that's safer for them. It naturally is throttling. It's going to give them more time to react. And I know there's someone going, yeah, but in the Ferrari, you can outmaneuver and avoid an accident. Sure. Yes. Same thing with heaters. Technically, my power has been out for two weeks. I need to heat it up. Oh, man. The power only came out for two hours. Had I had a better heater, would have fixed it. There's always the corner cases. But I'm talking tens of thousands of people and heaters sold what's going to work best for the majority of the people in the majority of the situations. And I think less wattage will do that. So the five watts per gallon longstanding rule of thumb isn't a thing for Corey. That's right. I don't adhere to that. Now, I, I, I understand how these rules come about. They come about with you got 10 people in the store and you got to help people and you just go, look, five watts per gallon is a great, just like us saying 78 degrees for fish, that works. Well, it doesn't work for discus and clown loaches and rams and apistos and this and goody can't go that high and dojo loaches don't like it and, and goldfish don't like it. <coughs> but it's a, a nice swag number. Ah, like 78, basically be fine, right? But when you want to do a good job, you go, well, it depends on the type of fish you have. Are you trying to run a cooler water tank or a hotter water tank? And that's where I think the wattage comes from. Are you running an acrylic tank? Holds energy better. Holds the temperature better. How warm do you keep your house? It's going to hold temperature better or worse. 
Are you going to run tops? Glass tops make a huge, huge difference. It's like you've ever been outside in the snow. You put a hat on, all of a sudden you're like, I'm snug as a bug in a rug. You take that hat off, I am freezing out here, right? How much equipment are you running? Are you running seven canister filters? Are you that guy or girl? Or are you running one sponge filter, so it's not really adding much heat at all? And are you running metal halide lights that are heating up your whole room? Or are you running real cool LEDs, right? All these things have a factor. Now, I think rules get started with the best intentions, but we don't modify them over time. So what does Corey mean by that? Let's say the year is 1970, and the common wisdom is 5 watts of heater per uh, gallon. Well, here we are in 2023. Things have gotten more efficient. Back in 1970, maybe it was only underground filters and maybe a sponge filter. No extra heat from equipment at all. Now, here we are in 2023. We've got all the technology in the world, right? Our houses are more warm and better built than they've ever been, right? Temperatures in general are going up just in the climate. You've got all these factors, but the rule never changed. Same thing. You need 10 times turnover per gallons per hour in your filtration. Well, over the years, filtration has gotten more and more and more efficient. We've learned more about biological processes. We've learned about plants. We've learned about uh, lighting, growing plants faster, all of these things. But we haven't changed the rules, right? And I think... It's an easy thing to say, and it doesn't really misguide people too much. And, and that's the thing. When, when we say 5 watts per gallon, if someone goes and they got a 100-gallon tank and they buy five of my heaters, they're just wasting money, and they're, they've got a little more risk. But it's not so widely out there that it's going to kill anything, so that's why it stays around. And so I do think, and, and I try very slowly to change these narratives. So instead of cycling aquariums, I try to encourage you guys and myself as well to season aquariums, build the ecosystem, not so much, is it the binary? Yes, it processes, processes ammonia or doesn't it? Do you have algae, right? Do you have plants growing? Do you have snails helping break stuff down? Do you have some scuds, right? Do you have any seed shrimp? Do you have any planaria? Do you have any fish? Do you have any bottom dwellers? What kind of food's going in? It's an ecosystem. You're seasoning that aquarium. Is it easy enough to say, ah, is it cycled? Yes, it is. But that, in my opinion, doesn't help move us towards where we want to go someday. But it's a long journey to get there. And so you'll see it in the groups. You'll see it on live streams and stuff like this where I talk about uh, these things in long format it's way, it's, it's way more work to explain why I think you should only use one heater. Let, let's, let's put it into perspective here because I think this one will help me sell a lot more stuff down the road. And two, it's a good example. The person's literally asking me, should they buy two or three of my heaters? And I tell them, I think they only need one, maybe two. So I'm going out of my way to take my time and it takes longer to cost myself money because I truly believe that what I said is better for them. And I believe in a long enough timeline, the more things that are in the best interest uh, of the customer will spread word of mouth, will make them trust me more and all of this down the road. So... I'm willing to take that time and I'm willing to try and save the money. And I don't go out of my way just to save you money. I literally try to do what I think is best for your scenario. Different people have different scenarios. So, you know, I, I hear what are the what are the parameters? I'll give you my best guess. And because I do it a lot, my guesses are fairly good most of the time. Sometimes I'm way off base. Let's be real. All my fish go crazy for extreme flakes if I just feed the community flake. And the frozen brine shrimp, is that enough? Will they likely have deficiencies? I doubt they'd have many deficiencies. Uh, I think a prepared food like an extreme flake has a wide profile of things it's adding. And then you've got 
the frozen food. I, I don't think long term you'd run into much problem. <laughs> Bring back season tank time. That's right. That is right. Can I add anything else? In a 75 gallon with a blood parrot, an electric blue Akara, the red shoulder Severum, and a Hecali. Uh, you don't have a whole lot going on down low. What about something funky like uh, some zebra loaches? I think that'd be a good one. Some Angelicus loaches. Mm. Uh-oh. This is where it gets a little crazy. This man has listed so many facts in three sentences that people spend hours and hours to learn. <laughs> I've spent a lot of time... Well... My job for many, many years, like 10 years of my of my hobby or my business, whatever, like a fish keeping career, my job has been learn as much as I can so when I'm with you in a store, I can help you. And the more succinct I can explain it or the better analogy I can use so that you'll understand. You know, I, I think there's a lot of ways to look at uh, a fish store employee and a lot of business owners would look at them like they're a salesman i look at them like they're a teacher if you teach the customer how to keep that fish alive and the things they need to do they will respect you if you've ever had a good teacher in your life you respect them because they taught you something and you were better for it you respect them not many times, and there's been a couple of times, but not many times in my life have I respected a salesman. Now, there's been salesmen that have treated me well and done a good job, and I actually do respect them. But on most times, inherently with a salesman, they're looking to get the commission or the sale and not so much make sure that I'm ultimately happy and successful. And I, I think that is, I think that's a big difference. And so while the end result is the same, they're getting paid to do a job, I think the intentions they set out to do long term will have an effect on uh, whether they ultimately get that respect and build that long lasting relationship. That's right. I'm a fax machine. I know she said fax. I have to force feed my angels everything except bloodworms. Why? Uh, think of it like children. If you gave them candy every day, and they go, I love candy. I'm a cookie monster. And then you go, hey, you need to eat your, uh, what, what would be something that's not like only vegetables, but like, hey, you need to sit down. You need to eat your lasagna. And they're like, I don't want to. I want candy. And you got, basically got to like, you got to eat that. You got to eat half of that. And then we can have dessert. That's kind of what's going on with your angels. You've given them lots of good food. They love the candy. And now you're going, hey, you need you need to eat some other stuff. Like you're just eating too much candy. That's not good. And so you basically need to wean them off the blood worms and go, okay, well, you're getting blood worms once or twice a week. If you don't eat today, that's fine. We'll eat tomorrow. And make sure you're not offering like, uh, you know, you're, you're offering them blood worms or the world's worst fish food. Like make sure it's something middle of the road, like pretty decent. So that way, like, okay, yeah, I'll eat this. Context is king. I live in the Midwest and keep this old house on the cool side in the winter. So I bought two aquarium co-op heaters for the 75 gallon. Yep. There's so many factors. Even if you had a cool house, like, do you know that an FX6, the FX5, the original one, uses 50 watts? That's a 50 watt heater on 24 7 in your aquarium. Most people didn't know that. You know, and you go, well, that hang on back. What's that's 12 watts? Okay, what about, you know, what if I ran my lights at night as opposed to day? Well, that's actually more efficient for heating, right? And so you can, you can build a lot. But when you're giving general advice, I try to be as open-ended as I can. And people might not want to only view their aquariums at night. And they might not have a canvas filter. They might not have this thing. And so I try to leave... It open-ended and knowing if we know all the factors, we can fill in and solve the problem. But most times in any interaction online, you get about 70% of the factors. And there's still 30% of like, well, had I known that, 
Had I known that your, you know, your house is very warm, but it's in front of a window or right next to the entryway door or this or that, that would have changed things. Um, several months into quarantining and deworming a Mabu puffer. I've done multiple rounds of Paracleanse and Expel P. Any flubendazole products you like. Um, 5.47 p.m. Hey, tone it down, watch. No, not really. Uh, I do a lot of times, I go with uh, Prozzi. So, Hikari's Prozzi Pro. You're going to go, but Paracleanse also has Prozzi in it, but not the same dosage. And I find Prozzi Pro to be very mild, as in fish, it doesn't seem to irritate them. And so you can go, you know, a couple extra weeks with Prozzi Pro, and seemingly they don't care. So that's nice. And it's another dewormer. So, but those are my main ones. Uh, the fact you've been through Paracleanse and Expel P, you probably have gotten the lion's share. My advice now, Tyler, would be maybe start putting body weight back on, as in feeding it well, watching it for the next three or four months. Is it putting on good body weight? If not, or you still are noticing like nodules in the poop or something, then maybe go ahead and Prozzi Pro and deworm some more. But if not, you probably got most of it or all of it. The ones that you can, you no guarantee you can get them all. Um, yeah, I would start there because there's, there's always like, well, I'm not a hundred percent. I'm not a hundred percent. You're never going to be a hundred percent right now. I feel like phew, you gotta be at 95, at least good, good odds. You've done the job well. So who else is a member of ditch the CO2 club? I got busy and CO2 made more work. I feel like I'm the poster child of that. Like CO2 is absolutely amazing. And I have to use it every day in my work at the warehouse and the store and that kind of stuff. But in my own personal tanks, very few CO2 tanks because they just speed up plant growth. And sometimes that's amazing. Like when you're selling plants and then sometimes that's real horrible when it's Christmas week. Right? So also like while I was, with my business partner for six weeks, basically, and neglecting the fish room, CO2 only made it worse. It made the nutrient deficiencies happen even faster. So it's great when it's great. It's kind of like driving really, really fast. Yeah, you're getting there faster, stuff's happening. But when you get in that wreck, it's all the more worse, right? So I'm in the, I'm definitely in the like, let's take the Toyota Camry and uh, just do a couple miles over the speed limit and get there nice and calm. That's me. I just got my order from Aquarium Co-op. I love the size of the plants. And you're putting free stickers in there again? Oh, you betcha. Most orders get a sticker. Uh, not all, because they're not tracked. So they're just on the desk, and they're every employee's supposed to put one in every order. Some get skipped every once in a while. But we were having a big old a big old jam up at where the sticker location was in the picking area. So we had to get rid of, we got rid of it all together for a while. And that's what you guys noticed. And then we go, hey, what do we just put it on there? And it's not a, it's a, you know, 90% of packages will get one. That's still pretty good. I have one of your sponge filters in my tank. It's probably a quarter or less way clogged and it's been five months. When should I clean it? The tank is doing super well. That's I can go years without servicing them sometimes. I would say when, you, when you're bored and you want to, go service it on Saturday. Like, yeah, I'm going to clean it. Didn't have to, but it's kind of like cleaning a car. How often should you wash your car? I don't know. Are you kind of bored? Is it a beautiful day today and you just want to kind of want to clean, clean it? Do it. I wouldn't do it the same day that I'm going to scrub all the algae, rearrange my plants, do this, do that, do that. But, you know. You can go a really long time with our sponge filters without them clogging. They're made to basically never clog. Now, there's a bunch of mulm in there, but I believe mulm is actually kind of beneficial for fry and, and microorganisms. So I don't necessarily want to clean that out, but I would if I was having some water clarity problems or um, had a fish knocking it around or something like that. 
The kids both really wanted the last clown lunch sticker. Yep. You got to... Those are easy to settle. When you have two kids and they both want the sticker, you make them have a clown loach fish dance off. Whichever one makes you laugh the hardest by trying to mimic a clown loach gets a sticker. <coughs> and then you just order a sticker like next time so that way the other kid gets one too. Used in a wait Used to work in a bookstore. Advice was always to suggest. I don't know this word. This is where like a book nerd is destroying me. To suggest a remaindered version of the book. I'm going to cough again. <coughs> Over the more expensive version. Customers are happy spending less money and more likely to come back and spend. I mean, I know like what a remainder is in like math, but what is remaindered? Remaindered. Definition. Uh, okay. So remain, remainder, without remainder, which is past tense, is dispose of a book left unsold at a reduced price. Titles are being remaindered increasingly quickly to save on overheads. That is a word I did not know, remaindered. What are you yelling at me for? My wife's yelling at me. She always yells like she thinks I can remotely hear her, and I never can. Have you ever been able to breed coolie loaches? No, I have not. Uh, let's see. How many coats did you bring when you're visiting uh, Detroit? No idea, but make sure you go. I think in Detroit is Yesterdog, and it's a fun place to go eat. Did you come over here, Tinky? Tink, come on. They said it's leftover. Yeah, leftover. I read the definition. Yeah, I said that before. That's what I was yelling at you about. Come on. Go get him. Go get him. I'm going to come give you kisses. You better go. <gasps> All right, well, back to the live stream because the dog is not cooperating. And my wife's just going to keep making dog noises. Yeah, but she looks so cute in the background. Uh, let's see. I've got a third. Oh, yeah, I've got three beautiful Amazon swords. My forty gallon, but they've started to take up too much room. How do you prune them before you just hack them away? Yeah, that's they get so sword plants get like three feet, kind of in both directions, which is brutal. Uh, kind of pinching off the big leaves at the bottom is really all you can do. And I would say the first step is maybe liquidate one of the swords, put it in a big bag, and and Find a friend to give it to, take it to a club, take it to the store. That'll give you a lot of breathing room and then kind of replant some of them. And then eventually I think, you know, in that 40 breeder you'd have one max because it, it'll fill a 40 breeder by itself and the roots will just be completely spread. So. You got a treat. I don't have a treat. That'd be lying. Yeah, but we'll give them. Dinky, come here. Come here. She's running. She's going. <laughs> Jumped over me. Yeah. All right. Uh, can we still get a hold of the fitted black hat? Do I have them somewhere in the store? No, but we we have one on the to-do list to go over merch at some point. It's just low on the list. It's not low on the there, The list is just huge. And we don't always rank everything. So it's just like, yeah, it's on the list. But, you know, this week, you know, for all we know air pump can't be shipped again you know there's always so there's stuff that jumps in the way and we have to deal with it and then there's okay everything's going real smooth let's start tackling some stuff will cleaning a sponge filter cause a balance to go off no it shouldn't it should not have any effect really that being said you could you know if you used really hot to chlorinate water kill all the bacteria but Done well, we're using like a bag and, and using tank water and stuff. Servicing a sponge filter should not change basically anything. The, 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 the puppies aren't camera shy. They just love mom way more than dad. And so because I, I'm working all the time, whether it's up here in the fish room or at a location, they've uh, imprinted and bonded with Katie way more than me. Now, 
they still demand dad time every night where they got to sit in my lap and all that. And you guys see those pictures on my Instagram. But in general, if they're like, well, there's a choice between mom or dad, they're always choosing mom. In fact, what was it last week or the week before, um, I took the dogs for a walk and Katie stayed back. She had stuff to do. I think she was going to have to do a, like a conference call or something. And Wincy, the other, the, the bigger dog that the tongue out didn't want to go, but they love to go for a walk, but they didn't want to go cause mom wasn't going, but I'm like, come on. She'd kind of like move 10 feet and stop, move 10 feet and stop. And so I get out of our driveway down the road, just like a little bit. And she decides I am not walking anymore, dad. And I'm kind of doing like, come on, come on. Cause sometimes she just wants, she always wants to go home. She wants to explore the yard, but then go home. And so normally if you get a little bit outside the yard, she goes, okay, let's go for a walk. Let's go far. And uh, this time she was like, nope, not doing that. She pulled out of her harness, which never has happened before and bolted. Luckily she bound straight towards home. And I texted my wife and I go, oh my gosh, Wincy just got loose. Need some help. And she opens the door and Wincy just bounds into the house through the door and all of that. And, uh, you know, luckily she could have bolted another way. We could have spent the next two days searching for her, but she went home. She's a, she's a mama's girl. She loves, you know, so now we know if I'm going to go for a walk with the dogs, I can only bring Tinky. She has no problem going without my wife. But if my wife is home, which I do walk the dogs. If, if Katie isn't home, I can walk both. No problem. But knowing that like, I'm leaving mom, I don't leave mom. And so learn lesson learned, I guess. Did I ever find those orange metallic flake platies? I've been looking for some cool strains, but it's been tough to find. Goliad has been out of libraries for a while too. I haven't. And I, I, you, you would probably think I'm lying. I check at least once every two weeks on Aquabid. Like I will pay I mean, not any amount of money, but I keep thinking like they could be a thousand dollars and I'd still buy them. Like I want those things back so bad. And it's probably going to be one of those things that, uh, once I get them, I'm like, these aren't as cool as I remember. But the reality is they were pretty cool and I've just been lusting after them for so long now again, it'll be worth it. I mean, I, I don't, I don't go out of my way to spend a thousand dollars on fish, but I'm just saying I want them real bad. So I would, I would pay probably more other people look at me like, yeah, they're like, I wouldn't even pay 50 bucks for those things. Meanwhile, I've built them up and put them on such a live bearer pedestal that I'd be willing to pay more than anybody else. Cause I'm a real nerd like that. I never see anyone in America talk about or use internal filters. Is it because they use a valuable tank space or is there other reasons? Well, I got news for you. You go watch KG Tropicals, they will talk your ear off about the CJ internal filter, which I personally hate that filter, but uh, they're just not popular in America. They're not prevalent in stores. They're very prevalent all around Europe, um, but I think a lot of it is a chicken and the egg. Because we don't know a lot about them, we're not buying them, they never do well in our market, so then no one's talking about them. Um, awaze has got some, Fluval's got some, everybody's got some but they just have never made it. They've never impressed me and they haven't won, um, you know, they haven't won over the public here. And so I think they're just going to keep struggling. It's kind of like tissue culture plants and other things that are popular in other countries, but not us. I think they could though. I think the right one could do really well in America, but I think the other problem is they don't really make big internal filters. And so a lot of us in America, we have more space and therefore <clears throat> there's no internal filter for my 800 gallon aquarium or my 230 gallon aquarium, or, you know, even my 125, like they kind of drop off the max is like 50 ish gallons. Really? I think. And you could say the same thing about sponge filters, by the way, uh, that they don't really make super duper big ones either. And I would agree. Why'd they get popular though? Cause I love them. I'm I I would I'm I'm taking credit for sponge filters. I didn't design them. Millions of people were using them before I ever did, and we're using them. But I I was I was thinking, I think I was talking to Zenzo, and I go I honestly wonder 
it was 10 years of Corey promoting sponge filters. Was that finally the catalyst for PetSmart to bring in sponge filters? Because they hadn't had it in my, <clears throat> they only ever had like the really crappy stick on one. And even then it was hit or miss. And I think only at Petco's. And I, I want to know, like, is 10 years of constant promotion for me, did that finally swing it enough that they carry some sponge filters now? I think they're overpriced a little bit. I think they're the fine foam that I don't like. But I am shocked to see something that had never been there in my entire hobby before and while running stores and stuff. So, yeah, I, I don't know. I'll never, you'll never get to know that. But I just, I wonder if, like, somewhere... Like, they're like, we're looking at the data. A lot of sponge filters moving. Let's do that. And I wonder how much that correlation is me. Or is it, turns out, none at all. So, I don't know. Fluval is always tripping. Ain't that the truth? Shout out from the Philippines. Oh, well, hello. I should be wrapping it up. My back is starting to get sweaty. It's not super duper hot today, so that's good. I just bought some Neon Tetras a couple days ago, and they're pretty much stay right next to the flow for my hang-on-back filter. Yeah, they might like the flow. Can I mix Ember Tetras and, and Angelfish? I've been able to do it. I've seen some people do it. I think, you know, you don't want adult angels and real small embers. You maybe grow the embers out first or get small angels and grow them together. But I think as long as you keep them well fed, you have a reasonable chance of them cohabitating doing well. Ember tetras get like a little bigger than people really think. They real nice color, great fish. I think they do better than do get bigger than people think. Flagfish are really good for hair, al hair algae. You're darn tootin' they are. Same with goodyids. Goodyids are pretty good with them too. What's my favorite fish I've ever kept? I go back and forth all the time. I still think uh, I really like guppies. I just bought some more today. Got some more coming. Let's see the fish I've got coming. I've got some. I've got some shrimp. I've got some midnight black guppies. I've got uh, some some yellow hyphen platies coming. Is that it? Maybe those three. Uh, and then the week before <clears throat> should be. Well, they might be here today. Actually, I bet you that's. I bet you when I. That's my guess. I bet you when I go downstairs, my wife's going to be like, you got this package. And that's what the, why the mailman came to my door. Could be my buffalo head cichlids that I ordered off Aquabid last week. Because um, I was like, I haven't bred those in so long. <clears throat> I like the blue eyes they have on them. And the fry are adorable. And so there's a listing for four of them. Hopefully I'll get male and female out of them. And uh, I want to see them kind of, you know, put around. Because they don't have a swim bladder, so they just always sit on the bottom. And so I see him put around the tank and perch up on like my purple jade rock and have some fun. So can Madagascar lace be propagated? Yes, Kyle. I saw that earlier and I forgot they can be propagated um, the way I've done it in the past. I think you even see it in the video a long time ago. Uh, but you get them to flower and you need multiple of them and you can cross pollinate them. So the thing they put up, that's called their stamen. You want to take a little uh, like paintbrush, paint one of them a bunch, collect the pollen and all that, and then paint the other one. And you should be technically, well, I don't know if technically, I believe there's basically like male and female plants. And as long as you cross pollinate them, they will then uh, germinate and drop a bunch of seeds. And so they will make a bunch of little babies, and then those grow out into new ones. That's how I've replicated them in the past. And if you have a breed reward program, you get mucho points when you uh, replicate a plant that way. So good to know. There's a new program in the Greater Seattle Aquarium Society uh, that I'm going to try and take part of. And it's a, it's a different version of the CARES program. I forget what they're calling it, but um, it goes by the the red list. And so I've got a decent amount of fish that are endangered in the wild and hard to get a hold of that I do spawn and replicate. And, and, uh, you get some points just for keeping them. You get points for breeding them. You get points for sharing them. Like if you bring them to an auction, that kind of stuff, you get points for writing an article about them and you can get points for giving a presentation about them. And so there's different types of fish that I think would be fun for me to do that. And, uh, if, 
it'd be fun to get the top rank of basically I've got the top rank of conserving fish with the club. I think that'd be a cool little fun project for me. So I, I might start working on that when I get the new fish room kind of dialed in a little bit. So Ray says the plants are both sexes, but isn't it, I, I'd have to Google it again, but I believe they have to cross pollinate. Like you can't, otherwise it would self replicate. And I believe they have to have whatever it is from the other plant and it doesn't always happen with just two. Sometimes you have to have more because they both are, you know, whether it's they're presenting one way or the other, I don't remember what it is, but I remember you have to cross pollinate them. So do I have my own YouTube channel? I do, but I, I never go live or I never do anything on there anymore. I always flirt with it like, oh, I could do a thing. And I'm like, I don't have time. I barely have time to do this channel and Facebook and the forum and, and all of that. And it's like adding anything to this is only taking away from something else. And if anything, I want to add more time to these things that I enjoy. So, all right, I'm going to call it there because I think I've got fish that probably need to find a tank. I've already fed my fish and stuff for the day, but uh, if they're a little bit cool, I want to warm them up. And I hear my wife's cooking dinner. And, uh, yeah, I've got to get ready for meetings and stuff like that tomorrow. So thanks for hanging out. Hopefully you're buying all of our stuff. I appreciate that. Aquariumcoop.com. We sell stuff. We've got rad warranties, rad customer service. Uh, we will ship it probably, you know, 20 minutes after you order it. I mean, not in the middle of the night, but if you order during the day, we ship wicked quick. And then it's in the hand of the carriers. They'll get it to you as fast as they can. And uh, we can at least guarantee you won't, we won't sit on it for days like so many companies do. I can't stand it when I order something like, you know, like if I order this shirt and it doesn't even ship for like four or five days. Like, come on, it could have shipped it way faster than that. So we will at least get it out the door that day or next day, depending on what time of day you order. And uh, yeah, thanks for supporting us. We'll see you maybe next week. I've got uh, Zenzo and Randy in town and we're doing a big old meeting and all that kind of stuff. Flew in just for that. So if I'm free by meeting time, we will do it. Likely we'll probably go to dinner and keep talking how we lower shipping and do these other things that are all these big important questions, the list that's ever growing. So thanks for hanging out. Uh, thanks for supporting and we'll see you next time. Now he's got to find the buttons. Oh, don't forget to compliment somebody and enjoy nature daily, by the way. Both those things could probably be done at the same time if you take a friend into nature. So do that. <laughs>